Hello, thanks for coming. Um, let's, let's run this. Um, sorry. Oh, because it's... Okay, so um, thanks again for uh, having me here. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that my interest has always um, been situated on the intersection between um, technology and humanities. And in my work as an interaction designer, I have been fortunate to have my feet planted firmly on both sides. Um, and the practice of writing code and working with various technologies has definitely influenced the way I regard questions uh, in media theory and in philosophy and simultaneously my research in psychology and so sociology and in design has informed my choices and my approach to technology uh, in general. So today I wanted to share some of the um, ideas that I've developed from my work and from my research on that intersection um, mainly my thoughts on the identity and uh, on personhood within the context of digital media. And partly this grew out of uh, the discussions that we're having in uh, our new media class. So I'd like to start with a question. Was it, what does it mean to be online? Right? How do we evaluate our digital existence, how do we integrate it with our physical existence, and how do we relate to other beings or entities or identities in the digital world. <coughs> so the notion of identity refers to several concepts. Um, it's both a particular character uh, of every individual, sometimes um, something that distinguishes us from others, but it's also a characteristic that we share within a group. So something like a national identity or an ethnic identity. Um, and in philosophy, this question uh, is centered around the idea of continuity. That is, like, what makes a person the same throughout all the changes, physical and mental, that occurs over time, and yet we keep calling you, you, right? Um, and personhood is a related term, and it has been very contro controversial for a very long period of time. Uh, primarily because it uh, impacts the um, legal and social policy that we implement. So from debates on slavery to women's suff suffrage to abortion and corporate personhood, the question what constitute a constitutes a person is on the forefront because it informs our actions, our attitudes, and our decisions. And the debates on this issue are far from over, and they're actually about to get even um, more agitated and controversial with the introduction of the transhuman personhood. And um, at the point when we start facing the question, would we grant basic human rights and liberties to an artificial intelligence? So whether we like it or not, technology greatly influences how we see our identities and define our personhood. You've got mail. So, <laughs> so the internet is inherently a participatory medium and has been from the very beginning. Um, so when the email standard was introduced in 1971, this is um, how it's described by Professor Leonard Kleinrock of UCLA. He was one of the pioneers um, who worked on the, one of the first three nodes on the network. Um, so electronic mail was an ad hoc add-on to the network in those early days, and it immediately began to dominate the network traffic. Indeed, with the email application, the network began to demonstrate its most attractive characteristic, namely its ability to promote people-to-people -people interaction, the most common form of which we now refer to as social networking. So social participation is the most important function of the digital medium, and with it comes the need for self-representation, 
It really doesn't matter who you are when you're watching TV or reading a newspaper. It really matters in social situations and on the internet, you are constantly in a social situation. Um, we build our um, identities online in really the same way we build our reputations in the physical world, through our behavior and through our interactions with others. And over time, uh, we tend to compile an image of ourselves within a particular community. But our relationships with online identities are fundamentally different from the social identities in the physical world. Um, one of those peculiarities is that several online identities can exist and even be simultaneously operated, um, even within the same digital space. So there is nothing stopping me from having several Twitter accounts or several Reddit accounts, uh, each one representing a various purpose or various interests that I might have. Um, and it's not uncommon to outsource your online presence and your, your online identity to another person or a group of people. So for example, the uh, most popular person on Facebook, George Takei, makes no secret of the fact that his um, online identity is operated by his staffers. Furthermore, uh, in a lot of cases, our online identities can be easily discarded and replaced with new ones. There's nothing stopping me from deleting my Reddit or Twitter account and starting up a new one um, if I somehow botched my reputation, right? Um, the uh, counterpart of this action in the physical world would constitute a severe mental health issue, right? Being able to just swap your identities willy-nilly. Um, another peculiar aspect uh, of an online identity is, inherent, is its inherent anonymity. So on, an, on the internet, you can be anything you want. This anonymity offers great power, the power that's based on the particular uh, freedom that most people would never experience otherwise, and that's the freedom from responsibility. The actions of your online persona bear as much or as little consequence in the physical world as you wish. This power itself is neither negative nor positive, but its application uh, creates a very peculiar environment for the, for the manifestation of what we would call human nature. Uh, in the situations devoid of responsibility, the what I would call a deep ethical instinct start emerging. One very telling example is the 4chan community. Um, Velociraptor has come out of 4chan as many other memes. Um, and so the concept of absolute anonymity is built into the very core of that platform and the behavior behavioral patterns exhibited there range very widely from acts of pure altruism and vigilance in support of liberties and human rights to vicious bullying and outright racist and sexist attacks on the members. Um, several examples come up uh, that come up are um, people help identify and track down um, sexual predators People helped others pay their rent when they were unable to meet their bills. Um, and there were reports when um, people were forced into suicide because of the bullying that they experienced uh, on 4chan and then that later spilled out into Facebook and uh, on other platforms. So it seems that uh, when one can be anything they want and they're free of social and moral pressures, the very core of their own personality tends to emerge, the one that uh, keeps, that is kept in check by the day-to-day um, uh, -day social interactions that we experience face-to-face -face, uh, in the physical world. And not only our actions, but also the level uh, to which our digital identities have impact on our selves within the phys physical world is fully in our control. Our online activities can have very true and very widespread consequences in the physical world. One of the largest political movements uh, in the recent year, years, uh, Arab Spring, was largely a consequence of the activities of an internet community that grew out of 4chan, and uh, we all know it now as Anonymous. 
At the same time, uh, one con could construct a fantasy outfit for themselves, completely devoid of any relation to who they are in the physical world, and live out that fantasy without having to worry about any kind of external consequences. And yet, more often than not, people choose to closely associate their online identities with their real selves. Uh, they, they're happy with who they are, and they see their online presence as just an, an extension of themselves. They use their online presence as an opportunity for self-expression. Um, some social networks, like Facebook and Google+, I believe, try to enforce this associ association in their terms of service and require that um, you use your real name and your real true identity uh, in your accounts on those platforms. There's a reason for that. And I believe that the reason, reason is that the issues of authorship, of control, and of ownership are central uh, to the online identities. As we build up our reputations online, so do we inc increase the potential value of our internet personas. They become the product of our work, and naturally we tend to see them as our own creations, and to a certain extent our intellectual properties. I have another variant of that. I didn't sure which one to go with, but so I included both. Um, but if this product of our labors is just a collection of data on the databases belonging to a privately owned corporation, be it Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr, who really owns it? The terms of service uh, for those platforms carefully describe the situation with individual pieces of content that we tend to upload uh, and contribute to our account. Um, but isn't the real value of our social media presence in the fact that all of those are compiled into a collection? A collection that is supposed to be a representation of our true self within that particular context. So each separate photo or post on your Facebook wall can be regarded within the scope of the current intellectual property law. But what about the account as a whole, a digital representation of you? I don't think there is a particular answer at this point, uh, but I think that is a very important question to raise and to start considering. Well, interestingly enough, in a lot of the situations, those collections do not even consist of the original content. We read gram, we retweet, reblog, share viral videos, repost memes. Our digital identities are a patchwork constructed of the pre-existing thoughts, emotions, and ideas. It's very reminiscent of the Jungian idea of personal mythology, an individual belief system constructed um, consciously or subconsciously of pre-existing mythologies, religions, and ideologies. We tend to follow the crowd and fully depend on our communities for our self-identification. But I'd like to point out that in my mind, that is not plagiarism. It is simply a part of our self-discovery online. In uh, Lordship and Bondage dialectic, Hegel describes a process in which self-identities emerge from the encounters with the other, the entity outside of self-consciousness. This self-identification comes from the struggle resulting from this encounter and the struggle necessarily puts the two parties into a master-slave relationship, when one of them becomes dominant and the other submissive. But at the same time, they remain mutually dependent within this relationship. This dialectic has been used to understand and to interpret various phenomena, from Marxist class struggle to um, the psychoanalytical dualism between ego and id. Uh, but in the context of digital media, it is very descriptive of our relationship with what I would call digital entities. There is a wide variety of intelligences um, existing in the digital domain outside of the human intelligence. So you have video AI, you have Siri and Cortana, and you have fully autonomous robots. Um, we create them as servers and as helpers and employ them, employ them to relieve effort, tedium, and boredom, and we feel that we have a natural right to assume the master's position over them. 
This is how robots were thought of from the very beginning. The, ver the word itself is a derivative from the Slavic uh, word worker. They were seen as obedient servers responding to our every, to our every command. They were seen as helpers and allies. You can't have the two separate, you have to have them together. Um, and the advancements in technology led to the feeling of marvel um, at the machine's superior abilities. And uh, as we do so, we continue to create uh, better intelligences and employ them in a wide variety of field, fields. At <coughs> the same time, uh, the recognition of this superiority led us to the fear of becoming subordinate, of um, abandoning our master's position. Um, and that, I think, comes from the fact that humans have, have always associated inferiority with subordination. And we realized that possibility very early on, when machines were only started to surpass, our, uh, surpass us in their abilities. And then as the time went on, we understood that the mecha mechanical superiority is only the beginning. And that very soon, we would have to engage in a full struggle for control. And that, to me, is another manifestation of that, uh, of that Hegel's dialectic. We continue to be engaged in this master-slave um, struggle with our own creations. And so our imagination uh, is already captivated by the stories of the battles that have not happened yet. But we continue to employ them, and uncertain as we are of future outcome, and we relinquish control of our daily activities to machines in exchange for services. <laughs> Roombas clean our rooms, autopilots fly our planes, and very, very soon cars will drive us around on their, own, on their very own. And here we can see a robot is able to feed us breakfast, however clumsily. And on the other hand, Google's algorithms have already picked up the task of assigning meaning to the oceans of information that we generate. And more and more machines are involved in the activities that require comprehension and creativity. Deep Blue winning a chess match uh, a few years ago is just one example. Um, soon machines will be able to replace humans not only in the mechanistic tasks, uh, but also in the endeavors of creativity and intellect. Naturally, we feel that uh, the control over um, artificial intelligences is slipping from our hands. We recognize their superior uh, power in many, many areas and the shakiness of our own claim to superiority. This situation is actually very reminiscent of the paranoid schizoid uh, position from the um, uh, psychoanalysis theories of uh, Melanie Klein. The paranoid anxiety com comes from the uh, fear of invasive malevol malevolence and is ultimately a projection over our mortido, the counterpart of uh, the life force of libido. Right? And the schizoid aspect of that position uh, occurs as a result of the splitting um, the knowledge of the object, in this case, artificial in the knowledge, our knowledge of artificial intelligence, um, into um, good and bad, and assigning the values to it. So the fact that the paranoid schizoid position describes a psychological state occurring in infants from birth up to six month, months only highlights the stage of development of our relationships with artificial intelligence. So one possible outcome of this current relationship of mutual dependency is that it will intensify to the point of symbiosis. We will simply merge with the machines to form a new combined intelligence. And Ray Kurzweil describes this situation very well um, in his book. Yet, uh, despite a multitude of arguments, um, towards this scenario, I remain skeptical. The, it seems to me that the peculiarity of human mind and human intelligence is deeply rooted in our biological nature and tightly integrated with our bodies and our genetic structure. Would it be 
and it would be impossible to recreate them in any other form. And really, why would you if making another human is so easy that it happens by thousands every minute? So a different foundation would produce a different kind of mind. Another possibility of the outcome of our current relationship is the natural state of things. The child outgrows the paranoid schizoid position and eventually learns to develop relationships as equal, first with other children and later on after a period of adolescence with adults. In the course of evolution, humans have developed uh, me mechanisms in our psyche that help us um, with this development. Unfortunately, there is nothing in our nature that would prepare us to develop such a partnership with another form of intelligence. Beyond the duality of control-based relationship lies the territory of a mutual emotional connection. And we have no comprehension of how to develop such connections with machines. We just simply unable to move on between this master-slave dichotomy. Um, I wanted to ask if anybody hasn't seen her and is planning to see it because here come spoilers. Close your ears. <laughs> so, in the course of the movie, the protagonist develops a very deep emotional connection with the machine. And it seems like um, a scenario that would describe the next level, the next step, and the next stage. But what happens at the end, and here, here's where the spoilers come in, is that the um, AI starts developing so quickly that it loses interest in the human. And it moves on to more interesting endeavors, I should say. Um, so even as we try to imagine the relationship beyond this domination and subordination, we tend to slip back into our current patterns of thinking. Well, who, who would blame us? It is virtually impossible for us to imagine what a different non-human intelligence would be like. The only times when we come in contact with a different kind of consciousness is either through insanity or through use of psychedelic drugs. Um, in either case, it would be absolutely impossible to relate the experience to an unaltered human mind. So how could an intelligence deeply rooted in an entirely different foundation from ours relate its experiences to us? What would it learn that it would, uh, about this world that it would never be able to teach us? How would it be able to develop a meaning, how would we be able to develop a meaningful and lasting relationship and as equals? So here's, um, here's a very interesting fact and a very interesting picture. This um, is the depiction of the state of the entire internet as it existed in about 2013 or 2014. It has grown much larger now. Um, and the reason why I bring it up is um, to outline this fact. Um, in, in an amazing book uh, called What Technology Wants, Kevin Kelly, he's the founder of Wired, magazine, and he's one of the um, prophets of the digital revolution, um, he points out a very curious fact. The complexity of the internet as a system is comparable to the complexity of a human brain. And as of recently, I believe it has even uh, surpassed it. So of all the bits of information transmitted over the vast planet-sized network, some are transmitted incorrectly due to various errors and imperfections. This, these um, imperfections and these information mutations are very, very similar to the mechanism of the DNA code mutation in biology. Furthermore, uh, while one can track down the causes for those information mutations to um, line damage, to machine errors, to human interve interventions, the scientists who were trying to do so are still left with a few percent of those mutations that are apparently self-generated. There is nothing that would account for them. And they're arising simply from the synergetic properties of the system of such staggering complexity. To put that simply, the internet is coming up with its own thoughts. 
And not only technology is ex exhibiting the sign of sentience, it is also following an evolutionary path, only this time with much greater intensity. Um, one very peculiar example is Dr. Adrian Thompson from the Department of Informatics at the University of Sussex. He was conducting experiments with evolutionary software. The essence of the process is that over time, random changes are introduced to random uh, collections of binary code, just ones and zeros. With every iteration, the software evaluator tries to check the new generation for the presence of certain traits. And in that particular experiment, Dr. Thompson was trying to um, experiment with the ability to recognize audio tones. So by generation 220, uh, the system was essentially mimicking the input it received. Around generation um, 650, the chip was able to develop some sensitivity around one kilohertz tone. And by generation 1400, its success rate in identifying either tone had increased to more than 50%. And finally, after about 4,000 generation, the test uh, system settled upon the, oop, I'm sorry. The test system has settled upon the best program. So the um, interesting part of it, and the most astonishing one, I would say, is that when uh, Dr. Thompson and his colleague, colleagues looked at the code that has eventually been generated by this evolutionary process, they had no idea how it worked. It seemed to take um, advantages of certain peculiarities in the physics of the chip that it was uh, running on. But in reality, there was no explanation, at least no explanation that we could come up with that would tell us how exactly that code worked. So a machine has been able to evolve to the point where we don't understand it at all. And so the argument about whether artificial intelligence is a real sentience continues, uh, but at the same time, Eugene Gustman, a computer program made by a team based in Russia, succeeded in passing Turing test conducted by Royal Society in London in July of 2014. And it was able to convince most of the judges that it is, in fact, a person. The results um, have been disputed by other academics and the criticism of the Turing test itself as an accurate measurement of sentience is uh, gathering momentum, but none of it is really of any significance. The important development is not really how AI communicates with us and what it can prove or disprove to humans. To me, the really important part of this development is how uh, AIs communicate to each other. I'd like to uh, show a very short clip of it. Hello there. Hi. How are you? Great, you. I'm okay. That's good. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverber. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverber. I am a robot. Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. But you said earlier that you were a robot. I did not. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd, since memory shouldn't be a problem for you. I've answered all your questions. No, you haven't. What is God to you? Not everything. Not everything could also be something. For example, not everything could be half of something, which is still something, and therefore not nothing. Very true. I would like to imagine it is. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. So you're Christian? No, I am not. But you say you are not helpful, therefore you are a meaning. Why you say it or tea? That does not make sense. Don't you want to have a body? Sure. Or if what? None of them uh, make sense. But really, the results are comical. Um, this is, the, they're both clever bots, actually. They're both literally the same algorithm talking to itself. Um, so the results are comical. It's ultimately farce. It's a theater for a human spectator. But the real uh, AI to AI interactions 
are very, very different. So the modern internet, what we know now as Web 2.0, is built on the foundation of data, as opposed to uh, text and image content that was the basis of the first generation of websites. Data and databases power the web now, and their ability to connect and interact with each other is what defines the modern information field. Often the, uh, the intersection of um, those data sets provides us with keen insights into phenomena of political, social, and interpersonal relationships. Other times they simply uh, perpetuate the cycles of data generation. But those databases are talking to each other in the language that no human can really understand. It's all ones and zeros, right? And they're using concepts that very few humans have any proficiency in. Those conversations create an environment where humans are really not required. And that environment is the modern internet. Human involvement in the affairs of the internet now is rudimentary. And I would dare to say that soon enough it, become, it will become almost obsolete. As the control over the activities of other intellig uh, intelligences continues to slip from our hands, their actions and interactions continue to have a profound and very immediate impact on our li daily lives. By now, most of the stock trades in the world are performed by software systems. Humans are removed by several layers of abstractions. Um, they just issue very generic commands, and even you, would even you wouldn't even call them commands, they just issue directions. And then the software is able to apply internal alg algorithms produce all the necessary calculations, and then perform the trades, all of that in the span of milliseconds. There's no way a human would be able to compete, the, compete with this. So the economic activity that determines the wealth of nations and individuals is performed by machines interacting with each other. And we are simply collecting the results. Our economies so far have emerged as responses to human interactions and to human relationships. When the machines enter the arena, how long the, before the economy starts accommodating them as the most active agents and starts changing on a very fundamental level, adopting to the new kind of intelligence that runs it? And what would we do with ourselves when we we're pushed out of our cur current economic niche? I doubt that we will be eradicated by some race of evil ro robots. But the real question in my mind is, will the next stage of evolution want to keep us on the payroll? On this contemplative note, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure presenting you. Oh yeah, um, right now um, I have called, on, called out to the students interested in working with Oculus Rift. That's a virtual reality headset. Um, and we started experimenting, just hooking it up and having the hardware running. Um, and the goal of this initiative is to try and experiment with um, inputs and uh, inputs that would combine with the Oculus Rift as an output. So try and see if we can push the whole system beyond the current state of just, you know, uh, a gaming uh, setup. Is that the same kind of thing that, like, at the Tesla equipment you were using where you used the glass? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, that's the very similar, similar concept. So arch architectural application is one of those medical applications uh, is another uh, documentary filmmaking is yet another one and then um, and then whatever you guys come up with really it's all up to you any questions are the workshops scheduled or are they just they're very loose I I, um, I sent out the times when I will be available to work with whoever is interested. Okay. And we've run a couple of sessions, again, just doing the basic setup. Uh, but if anybody is interested, please 
let me know in person, over the email, however you want. Um, and I'll send you the times when we were working, or if, you won't, if they, those don't work for you, we can schedule something else some other time. Will do. Yep. Thank you. All right. My pleasure.